start because the assumption, whoever is suggesting this, is neither the social worker nor the police officer is my guess, uh, because both of those parties should uh, know that they are very much apples and oranges and they are not interchangeable. Um, so when you think about that process, a lot of times police calls come in, and let's just, let's just take your example. Let's say that we have someone who's under the influence. When that officer shows up and they see that person's behavior and the person reports or has an active engagement with some type of hallucination, you know, they're seeing things that aren't necessarily there, they're hearing things that aren't necessarily there. Generally speaking, there are natural causes for that, like schizophrenia, you know, other type of disorders that would create that hallucination, but there's also drug-induced psychosis, and you cannot tell in, in a matter of minutes whether or not the person is suffering from a mental illness or from a drug-induced psychosis state. So in, in thinking about that, there's no way we could know that right off the bat. The second thing is that I didn't sign up to go into anybody's home and be shot at. If I wanted to do that, and if or I wanted to answer or... domestic violence calls, I would have just gone into law enforcement. That was not, that is not the intention of social workers. And while they do great things, and there's a lot of wonderful resources, these two parties are not interchangeable and they cannot replace one another. Why are they trying to do this? Oh, I think they're just angry at police officers and the media has capitalized on that and it's part of a specific narrative or agenda. I, I just, I also find it very ironic that a town, New York City, that was so quote unquote appreciative and loving toward first responders after September 11th is, has, has now and mostly completely abandoned them. You know, you look at some of the interactions that New York City police officers have with people on the street, they're getting buckets of water poured on them, they're getting yelled at, spit on, all of those kinds of things. And for a town that supposedly loved first responders, when they were completely and totally devastated, they have turned their back, for the most part, on those officers. Over the course of 19 years. Over the course of 19, 19 years. 19 years ago, they were heroes. Yes. Today, not yes. so much. Yes, and today, not so much. That's exactly right. So one of the issues that people forget about is that we think about putting social workers in people's homes to help them and to get them resources. And that's a great concept, but that is such a misconception because we don't necessarily have the resources to refer people to. And second of all, the beauty of working in the adult population versus the child population is that when you work in APS or Adult Protective Services, if that person over the age of 18 says, I don't want your help, get out of my house, boy, you're free and clear. You don't have to worry about anything. And, and as, a, as a former in-home worker, I was okay with that. Why? Because people have the autonomy to choose their own path. And if they don't want my help, I'm not going to force it on them. Right. Children, however, are a different story. And they don't have a choice, which is why child welfare is completely different than adult protective services. It's just a crazy time. I've never seen such a... Um, negative feeling. A few years ago we went through the, the bad feelings toward the police and there were some of them shot in their cars while they said and that mm -hmm. again has happened by mm -hmm. the way over the And that weekend. continues, yes. And um, just the idea of defunding police and using social workers, I mean that's mm -hmm. to me it's like just sending the wrong person for the job. Oh absolutely. I mean you completely. Would, you would never have a neurologist treat an oncology problem, would Wait. you? No, but you no. know what you're going to have, and unfortunately, I hate to say this, and I know this is along your line of work, you're going to have a bunch of dead or injured social workers. That is exactly right. And you know what? It's funny you say that, because when you look at statistically the most dangerous jobs in America, I, I, if I remember right, when I was working in the home visit world, um, it was number four, meaning that workers in the home were hurt so frequently that it was the number four dangerous job in America, right behind working on oil rigs and construction projects. And you have to remember that when you're going into someone's home, they're not necessarily welcoming you with open arms. This sure, is not a, hey, in. come on in, let's have a have, glass of sweet tea have some coffee type cake. conversation. Yes, and so I've been in homes before where I remember walking in and there's a shotgun behind the front door. Mm -hmm. I've walked in before and they lock the door behind me and we have to have a conversation where I say this is to never happen again mm -hmm. and if, if it does happen again I will not be returning. Um, you have to have backing though from leadership in order to make those decisions. I don't know that I have that backing but it was my personal decision that I was not going to go in a home like that. But you have to think about where you're going, what rooms you're entering, all of those kinds of things. And I've had people before 
who they think that there are voices coming from the floorboards. You know, they think that when you drive a vehicle with a government tag or if you have a state ID, that you're there for the wrong reasons and they greet you in the driveway with a shotgun. And mm -hmm. as much as I get that, it does not help worker safety. You also have to remember that not everybody has the best intentions. Some people are predators, and even though they look like they are folks who are disadvantaged or they need help, it doesn't mean they're any less predatory than anyone else. Right. How, do you, how do you make these decisions? I guess spending a little bit of time with them. As a worker? And, and no, no, noticing your environment. Number one, your environment's going to tell you a lot, but then the personality going to tell you a lot. So one thing is, is when you screen people on the phone, you know, asking certain questions is really important. Do you live alone? Do you have pets? All of those kinds of things. You know, logistical in nature. The other part is to kind of screen to see where they are mentally, but assessing for police officers and social workers, this might be the only thing they have in common, is that assessing starts from the beginning. When you pull into their driveway, the first question is, can I even park in the driveway? Should I be parking in the street? The second is, where are the entry doors? What's around the house? And then when you enter somebody's home, it's where is everything logistically? What is the layout of the home? And I've had people who I've walked in before and they invite me to uh, the back bedroom or the basement and I immediately say no we're gonna stay in a common communal area I appreciate the wow. invitation yeah I know it tell me about it. It takes a lot of nerve to do that I think. Uh, it does and maybe I think they're socially awkward maybe they don't realize sometime, what they're actually asking. Oh no they know exactly what they're asking they know exactly what they're asking I think sometimes it's just to get a rise out of people and to see a reaction. Maybe they're trying to get you alone and, and, and that's the other thing Especially how much of the time lady, maybe they're trying to how much of the time are you going alone? You. Yeah, well, and it's not even seduction, it's it's overpowering. And you know, that's the other thing is, you cannot expect a social worker to replace a police officer because there is no training in tactical defense. I don't get to carry a firearm. You know, I'm going into someone that's else's the territory. They yes. want somebody that's not gonna carry yes. a firearm. And so that victims can't, well, let's see, because then you would become the victim if you got killed. But So what's the likelihood of actually having defunded police departments, do you think? There's been a lot of talk. I think it all depends on where you live. I think that it will be a very short-lived, it will be, to some criminals, it mm -hmm. will be an absolute free-for-all. It will be. A free-for-all. It will be. And it will not be good for the mental health population. It's not good for anybody. Well, fear, body. number one, and, and lots of people in these areas, they're going to have a lot of fear to deal with all of a sudden. The security yes. of having law and order, the security of having the police officers to mm -hmm. respond, mm -hmm. that would be over. And it's every man, every woman for themselves. You know, if, if, the, if the people who are creating these ideas, if they want to start with their city, specifically their neighborhood, by all means, you go right ahead. But the problem is they're saying, we want to defund everything else, but I want you on my block all the time. Well, you know what's going to happen, too, and the people that handle law themselves, they're going to end up killing people, too, because well, that's part of law enforcement. That's, that's unfortunately Someone's part of law enforcement. Someone's going to wave a gun at you, and yes. you're going to have to make the decision, is it going to be me that goes home to my kids, Yes. or is it going to be that person? I tell you home? what, I tell you what, I would make a deal with people. If we wanted to even partially defund the police, I think I would be okay with that if every state had constitutional carry or some type of agreement that people could carry their own firearms for their own self-protection. But in California, Oklahoma has that. Oh, we have that because we live in a great place. But in California, you have to justify to law enforcement why you need a concealed carry permit. And in the state of New York, at least in New York City, it, it just went to the Supreme Court in December that you could have a purchase, I'm sorry, a possession permit and you could have a transport permit, but unless you were going from your home to the gun range with a locked and unloaded firearm, that right. was the only way you could transport that. I, I so you couldn't actually carry it on your person in public. It was totally pointless. I go back in thought every time to Paris, France, to the theater where mm -hmm. there were thousand maybe people or thousands in that theater there was no there were no guns in there mm -hmm. shooter upper level just destroying people should you had an open carry if you would have had good guns is what I call them mm -hmm. in, in the balcony around that person he would have been dropped in seconds if not within a minute and look at how many lives would have been saved mm -hmm. my personal opinion my personal opinion, mm -hmm. but when you get a shooter in an environment where there is absolutely nothing to stop them, to me that is the most horrific situation, and especially in crowded venues like that where 
Um, we've had the training here, and I suggest you contact the Muskogee Police Department. They will mm -hmm. give you sh uh, sh a shooter training. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't even, this social worker slash police thing doesn't even talk about people that have their designs on being a killer as in a shooter situation. You're going to send a social worker to a, sh a sh active shooter situation? And that's that's what? that's one of the other things is that I would rather as as a provider as a licensed provider who's had enough in home experience and enough in office experience I would rather be in the home of an alcoholic than the home of a schizophrenic because at least I can reason with the alcoholic there's cognitive functioning there they can sober up a little bit but if schizophrenia is real and the hallucinations or we have a delusional disorder, I'm not going to be able to talk that person down because they really think that what they believe is true. And, I'll and give you, they have other voices and other things. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Out yes. talking you. Yes, and we, and we call those command hallucinations. Okay. And so in thinking about that process, I will never forget I, when I started grad school the year before there was a memorial run and it was called Terry Tuff mm -hmm. and Terry was a student social worker in graduate school at KU who had gone to this man's home at his request and he ends up murdering her and now she has her own memorial run and nice. I don't I don't want that she has no life that. but hey she has a memorial run yes, and, she has a, and I don't want that and I don't want that yeah. for any of my colleagues and so when you think about that and you think oh that doesn't hardly ever happen you know whoever is proposing this idea you're absolutely wrong it happens all the time people get hurt in in the home visit world all the time right. you know so in thinking about that you know we really need to be supportive of our police officers because we wouldn't be safe without them we need to be supportive of our mental health providers because we wouldn't be able to help people without them but they are not interchangeable and they are not the same we, Lauren, we need both of them. Lauren Rich, our guest this morning. Want to comment on this? It should be posting this up on YouTube here just a little bit later today. So make sure you look it up. Channel is uh, Lauren Rich, uh, Rich, Rich Consulting. Yeah. Rich Consulting. You can come bad mouth me on YouTube if you yeah. want. Yeah, <laughs> bad mouth or show her some love and support. You know, what do you think about, or just give your honest opinion, what do you think about defunding the police? I have kind of thought of a, a thing that might help resolve a lot of the problems. and. Maybe you can even make comments on this, but we have a lot of technology available today, and I know that there are times when police officers have to use lethal force, but what if we had something that was just sub-lethal, like a stun gun? We or, do. Or, I mean, something more powerful, something that would drop somebody instantly, because I've seen people with the tasers, we they're do. walking around We do, like we already crazy. have those. Pepper guns, beanbag guns, flashbangs. Flashbangs will drop you to the ground. Maybe so, but nevertheless, I. I, I yeah. guess we're in this situation mm -hmm. where maybe we could end all of the defunding if we could find a safe way for the police to be, for them to be safe, but yet a non-lethal force that is guaranteed to drop the person every single time. We've already got that. We need the Star Trek stun gun. And remember We've that? We've already got that. So we the need, phasers to stun. We, uh, we need, we need better quality training. <laughs> and do you know how many hours of mental health training Oklahoma, I'm going to say Oklahoma officers are required to get every year. Do you know how many hours? No. One hour. Yeah. Well, if it's One a useful hour. hour, right? That is insufficient for any officer. I don't care who you are. Right. And so if, if we had uh, better education and we had more officers, we wouldn't be as tired and exhausted, and we'd probably make better decisions all around. They only get one hour. It's crazy. You know how many DJs get a year? How many? Zero. Zero. Well, well add, up, add up my Monday morning 15-minute <laughs> segment times 52. Yeah, right. I might get a little bit here. <laughs> yes. Thanks yes. for being here. Coming up next, the Bedouin Shriners are here. They are...